okay? Remember from my presentation on Monday, last Monday, half of the occurrence data available for, for Rwanda were bird observations, right? And so we're, one of our future courses, I don't know if it's 2020 or 2021, but one of our future courses is about baseline data and detecting change in biodiversity. And so we'll be talking about these questions. And so you can imagine, remember I'm after things that we can do anywhere in the world, you can imagine going through the historical records of sampling of biodiversity for your countries, finding those sites that have been sampled thoroughly, and replicating that sampling as exactly as possible. Okay, it's something that, that is quite doable. I mean, Emmanuel, you're on the slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro, right? That's a place that's been sampled massively. And, you know, the, um, in the Congo and, and here in Rwanda, the Belgians during the colonial era were very, very detailed about their sampling. And they have sites that were sampled incredibly well. Many times those data are not digital, not accessible. And so you have to go to the institution, maybe in Africa, maybe in, in Europe or North America, but you go to the institution and you find a way to capture those data. And sometimes it means, and I've done this, going through every cabinet in the other museum. Literally. You know, you could say, okay, I'm at the British Museum and I know that the British Museum has enormous historical collections from Mount Kenya and I want to replicate them. So I'm going to go through all one million specimens of birds in the British Museum. And what you do is, you know, each case has a label that says what taxa are in there. And you see, is any of these taxa in Africa or in East Africa. No, keep going. Oh yeah, here are, you know, Taracos. And so, oh yeah, this one I have to go through. Then you go through real quickly. I mean, it takes weeks of work. But imagine what you learn. You know, what was collected at this site 120 years ago. And in the best cases, you have field notes or published records of the expedition and they tell you where they camped and how they sampled and you build your sampling to replicate that. And then you can get these before and after <clears throat> comparisons. So again, I'm trying very hard, just as in the last talk, I'm trying very hard to lay out for you ideas and methods that are feasibly um, implemented here or anywhere. Okay? Okay, so how do we summarize community composition? I just showed you some relatively detailed analyses of, of data, but there are other ways. Um, probably most of you have heard about the IUCN range polygons for vertebrates. Everybody know what those are? Okay, I call them um, maps drawn by experts with crayons. You know, crayons for your kids to draw with. Yeah. So what they do is, you know, they'll, they'll say, okay, you know, let's talk about such and such species. You know, draw its extent of occurrence. And they draw something like that. Okay, and you know, maybe there are populations here and here and here and here and here. And then the expert says, well, I know they're gonna be down here too. And so I'm gonna include that in my, in my polygon. Well, those, those extent of occurrence polygons have been developed for um, all birds, all mammals, I think all amphibians, 
and then a, a couple other groups, you know, like seagrasses and things like that. And those are available pretty much for open download, which is to say the ones that are held by IUCN, you can download. They're in about the dumbest GIS format possible because they're in a single shape file. Watch on Millie's face. A single shape file with 10,000 polygons. Oh. <laughs> I knew we'd get something fun out of her for that one. Um, the bird data set is allegedly open access, but you have to ask for it and have your request approved by BirdLife International. And if the tone of my voice is not clear, I disapprove of that. It should just be open. Um, so these IUCN polygons have been used quite a bit. I'll show you an example. Um, they've been used for things like this to look at range size and extinction risk. I'll show you a bit of the attack that I did on that idea. Um, they've been used in a huge number of macroecological studies, basically as a way of quickly finding out what is the set of species present in this pixel, in this pixel, in this pixel worldwide. Okay? So here, here's what they look like. These polygons, sorry, these are Mexican examples again. But you see these big, you know, the, the plant leaf description would be entire, right? Instead of jagged or interrupted. And, you know, species distributions don't look like that. They have very uneven edges depending on where different environments are. So, sorry, there's a lot going on here, but I just wanted you to see these are the IUCN polygons for three species of birds in Mexico. And then the points are the actual occurrences. What? Oops. And so, essentially, you can see that these polygons hit the major features of the distribution. And then there are a lot of things that are like marginally left out. But then there are also things where they miss a whole population, right? And then there are some where it just looks like they're off. Like this polygon should be up here. And it's not. And so this is what happens when you give maybe very knowledgeable experts, but you give them a big crayon and you know, you can't like draw detail, you have to do this, right? So that's, that's the level of error. And then for a bunch of species, we just tallied up what's the total number of occurrence data points, the total number of X's in existing, and what's the percent that is within the IUCN polygon for that species. So, you know, what percent of the black points are within the polygons versus outside? And you can see some of them are up at 100, and a lot of them are up above 80%. One of them is at 23%. Ridiculous. But also, you know, that's, that's what we call error of omission. Right? I have positive points, how many of them are left out? Now, if I really had detailed surveys of all of this polygon, how many sites are included within that polygon but don't hold the species? Okay? Error of commission, a false positive you could call it. But that's to say that this is an overestimate of the size of the distribution of the species within that polygon. That's not good. It's making both kinds of errors, and it's making both kinds of errors in, in abundance. For example, all three of these species are montane species. And Mexico is not you know, one big mountain that's really high. There is a mountain range that runs like this, and it is made up of volcanoes. And so you can see one here, one here, one here, one here, one here, one here, one. And in between, it's valleys. Species is not there. Okay? So 
again, this is something that I can go on for hours about. I'll try not to. Um, this is an illustration here for one of the J's that I study. Um, here's southern Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua. Okay. These dotted black and white lines are the IUCN polygons. You can see these yellow squares. Those are the known occurrences of the species. And the red areas are the areas that are uh, probable distribution of the species based on a detailed ecological niche model. And what I want you to see is how much of this polygon is empty. Right? This one's a little bit more full. But basically, that polygon really dramatically misrepresents the distribution of that species. Okay, so you're going to see a ton of um, you're going to see a ton of analyses out there in the literature based on the IUCN range polygons. And this is what I was saying earlier: just because it's in the literature doesn't mean it's true, doesn't mean it's reliable, and doesn't mean it's good science. So when you see something based on the IUCN range polygons, ask yourself, is this an appropriate use? The, the research group that we were criticizing in this paper went so far as to buy land, hectare by hectare, based on refining these polygons. So you take, you know, a polygon that looks like this, and you say, my species occurs between 1,000 and 1,300 meters only. And so you chop it down. And then you say, my species only occurs in forests, and so you chop it down more. And based on that kind of analysis, if you want to call it an analysis, they were buying land for conservation. And I consider that irresponsible bullshit. And there's nothing nicer that I can say. And that was a leading voice in the world of conservation biology. And that voice was rather strident when we, t when we had the temerity to criticize him. So I come back to my theme song. Please, can we use primary data? And I'm going to sing that song to you over and over and over and over again. And so remember, you know, go back to our conversations of a week ago about how do you enable biodiversity data for Rwanda or for any of your countries. It's not just biodiversity data that you want. And guess what? It's not just, <coughs> it's not just EBVs, essential biodiversity variables. Because you will remember that EBVs are a first level of abstraction of the primary data. Remember that? You don't want that. What you guys should want, what we all should want, is primary research grade data. The actual data points that were collected in the real world, in the field, looking at individuals of each of these species that we're interested in, those are the data that you want because those are the data from which you can construct any secondary product. But they might not be on the list of essential biodiversity variables. They may be your own biodiversity variables. It may be the Botswana essential bio biodiversity variable, whatever that may be. Or it may be just something that you consider important for your own study. But if somebody offers you a wonderful collection of digital range maps for your species, for the species of your country, say, no, thank you. Give me the, give me the data, please. OK? Anything else handicaps you as a scientist. OK, so let's, let's look for some primary data. And there's this really nice facility called Map of Life. It is a project that was funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation. It's run by some very well-published scientists.
And it says, putting biodiversity on the map. Cool. Okay, so let's look at von der Decken's hornbill. So Takus decani. Neat distribution. Okay, going kind of from Tanzania, Kenya, looks like a little bit into, into Uganda, up into Ethiopia and Somalia. Okay, and map of life, it's really cool. I mean, look at that. It's got data from local inventories. It's got data from expert range maps. There's our IUCN polygon. It's got data from more or less niche models, the orange. It's got data from point observations, from gridded surveys, and from regional checklists. So it's this really cool pool of different data. Obviously what I want are the points, right? Because those are primary data. This range map or this, this niche model based map, those are secondary. They came from some interpretation or summary, but something that abstracted the data. So I want the points, but I want you to do a look around this, this page. What do you not see? Yeah. So, excuse my language, but there's no download button. There never has been. And you say, what the hell? How can the National Science Foundation fund a very expensive project by some really good researchers and you can't get to the information? You just look. Mm -hmm. You can't even export an image of the stinking map. Really? Can you believe it? It's bullshit. Sorry about my American English, but that's bullshit. Okay. Map of life, that's just a... I don't understand it. I don't understand why the National Science Foundation would fund it without a download button, or why they would ever fund those researchers ever again if they'd promised a download button, then there wasn't one. But that's <laughs> bullshit. Okay? Not all of those data are licensed for reserving. I understand that. But a great number of them are. So, no excuses. Don't, and I'm saying this to everybody around the world, don't give me pretty pictures. Give me primary research grade data. Because without that, you're not respecting me as a scientist, okay? I need unitary data, and I'll develop my own view of the world from that. So we've already shown you GBIF, and GBIF is primary research grade data. It's large amounts of it. It is spatially biased. I'll show you pictures later in the course of that. Um, and so GBIF is not perfect, it's far from it. Uh, but at least it has the right structure. It is a flow-through distributed biodiversity information portal, which is to say if an institution here in Rwanda, like the University of Rwanda, has data, and has the will to share it. That institution can share it, but retains ownership of the data. And um, essentially controls what of that, da that data set is served. So it may be, you know, some rare orchid species is found on one rock, and they might have very, very, very precise GPS coordinates. But if you put those out, they'd probably be misused. And so those coordinates can be shielded. 
shielded, but you acknowledge their existence, and somebody can come to the data owner institution and say, here are my credentials as a scientist, please give me access to those data, and then they can decide, okay? So GBIF has the right design at least. Um, so I'm, I told you about this before, I'm grabbing two data sets. One is the Taracos of the world, because Taracos are endemic to Africa. And the other is country or area, Mexico, scientific name, family, Corvidae. Okay? And so there's one of the Taracos, and there's one of my favorite of the Jays. This is, this is endemic to the mountains above Acapulco in southwestern Mexico. In each case, you've got about 150,000 points. Sorry, a little bit more than that. 203,000 for Taracos and 183,000 for Corvids in Mexico. Okay, it's a lot of points. Neither of these is a huge number of species. I did that on purpose. It's pretty neat. It doesn't, we don't get that information for the Musophagiformes, but for the Corvids, the data, these 183,000 records came from 143 different data sets. Okay, that's really cool. That's saying that everybody around the world is collaborating to create a pool of primary research grade data. Okay? What I'm gonna do, kind of in the next hour, is I'm gonna do this analysis for you. You probably should keep some careful notes. And then I'm gonna give you the data for this. We're gonna see what you do. So here's what you're gonna do. You're going to obtain data from GBIF. I'm gonna do that for you. You're gonna clean and improve your data. Eh, I did a quick cleaning. I got rid of some of the, the real garbage. Um, but we're not gonna worry about this because we're not gonna publish this or use it for anything. We're gonna isolate the occurrence data that are usable because there are gonna be some that aren't really usable. Okay, so. That's kind of in, in Excel. You'd be amazed at the stuff you can do in Excel. Okay. Um, you're gonna import that into a GIS, QGIS, just as a point, point file. I know, you haven't done that, that's okay. I'll show you how. You have plenty of people around to help you. You did that, sorry. You have done that so you have no excuse and nobody's gonna help you. <laughs> so we're going to turn that into a shape file of the occurrence data. So that's the difference between having imported it as a table and then you save it as a shape file. You can do more things with that than you could with the table. For your country, Mexico, or region, Africa, you're going to create a uniform set of polygons across it. And probably Amelie's going to cringe because, no, I didn't, I didn't project it. <laughs> Do that. I'm trying to keep this simple and dual because I want somebody to go home with this spectacular t-shirt at the end of the day. Okay? And here's the interesting thing we're going to do. We're going to do what's called a spatial join. So we're going to take our shapefile of occurrence data and we're going to attach to it the identification of the polygon in the fishnet. So essentially, if this is a polygon and your point falls here, this polygon has an ID number in its attribute table. And so in the attributes table of the point is gonna be the ID number of the polygon. It's a very easy thing to do, but it's incredibly powerful. So that's this join. And then we're gonna take the attribute table of the points and we're gonna export it back to Excel. Now what do we have? 
we have our original research grade primary data set with a polygon ID. And we're going to take that polygon ID and we're going to use it to figure out how many species have been recorded. Not have been posited there by some expert with a crayon, right? But how many have actually been recorded there? And that's going to give us a table of polygon ID versus number of species, or even individual species. And we're going to take that back into our GIS, link it to our fishnet, and we'll have a really cool map of Turaco um, species richness across Africa. Okay?